Um, thank you for joining us on this snowy day today. Um, I'm Kate Cagney, the director of the Institute for Social Research here at UM, and I'm so glad you could join us for our Insight Speaker Series. And this has been a really important component of uh, reflecting the work of our community here. It's a forum for ISR faculty to share their research to inform the public good. Um, I often describe ISR, many of you are aware of its structure, but I do like to take this moment to say that we have over 300 affiliated faculty, 1,200 staff who conduct research that addresses topics such as wealth and inequality, race and racism, that'll be an important component today, politics and public opinion, as well as a wide range of other topics, including teen drug use, economic behavior, aging, health, really the gamut of social science research. Um, our full schedule of Insights Talks is available on the ISR website, as well as recording of past talks if you want to go check any of that out. Um, and we'll certainly be posting the video um, from today's as well. So let me tell you a little bit about today and what we have to look forward to. I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, Lou Penner, He's emeritus professor of oncology, Wayne State University, and the Kermanos Cancer Center, and an adjunct research scientist in, in the ISR's Research Center for Group Dynamics. Dr. Penner's research focuses on how personal attributes, social factors, affect the quality of the healthcare people receive with a focus on racial and ethnic care disparities and how race-related attitudes may affect quality of care. Today he'll share with us his research from Unequal Health. You see it up here. You can order it on Amazon, I hope. <laughs> so, um, and selling it at the corner later. So. <laughs> Perfect. I love it. Yeah, great. We'll help out. Um, and uh, its tagline, Anti-Black Racism and the Threat to America's Health, um, which he co-authored in 2023. So it's really new work, um, and that's terrific, and, and um, we will be purchasing it. Um, it contends that anti-Black racism is a significant contributor to health disparities. Dr. Presenter, Pre Dr. Penner will present the ways in which racism endangers the health of Black Americans and the quality of the health care they receive, and also discuss potential solutions to this problem. I think this is really important contemporary work as we think about a lot of coverage recently about um, uh, racial differences across childbearing and the outcomes both for the infants and for the mothers. Um, lots of data um, to, to be drawn on in terms of what we're observing. And so I'm hoping uh, what we discuss today and the accompanying manuscript will give us guidance. Um, we'll have time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. I'm sure if you wanted to chime in, uh, Dr. Penner will welcome it. And, and so let's welcome Dr. Penner. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I guess we're in the afternoon now, so I'll say good afternoon. Uh, what I'm doing right now uh, is I'm setting a timer for 35 minutes. I do tend to go on uh, and I want to allow um, time for questions and for discussion. I'll go over 35 minutes, but then I'll know and uh, I'll close in. A couple things I want to say about the, the talk and my talk. The first and most important thing is I'm going to show you some images which are deterred or can be disturbing and are clearly offensive. I don't do that for the purpose of shocking you or making you feel uncomfortable. The topic that I'm going to talk about is one that is disturbing and, and uh, difficult. So I want you to understand that really it's not, it's not for shock value. The other thing I should mention, once I get going, my background, I, I spent 35 years in public education, 2003, teaching psychology at the University of Florida, and I also taught social science, and so I'm used to teaching 500 people, and as I get going, my style much more declarative, and I'll start saying, okay, at the end sentences as if, don't you understand? Uh, oh, okay. Um, so um, it's probably best to hold the questions to the end, but try to remember them just so I get through the material. Okay, let's begin. This is the book um, that we wrote. Uh, hopefully, I might have time later to tell you what brought us to um, um, writing the book. Um, uh, my co-authors, Jack DeVideo, is a very long and close friend. Uh, he's just retired from Yale. Now Hagawara is uh, a former postdoc with us in Detroit, who is a professor of medicine, a professor in the School of Medicine in Virginia. And Brian Smedley is a person who has a long and very distinguished record in public policy um, uh, related to health disparities. 
Brian is also, for those, any of you from Detroit, um, uh, Brian is the godson of Charles Wright of the Wright Museum. I didn't discover that until very late in, uh, in the writing of this. So this is what I'm going to talk about today. We're going to talk first to give you a little bit of overview of racial disparities, health disparities in America. I want to talk a little bit about what exactly we mean by race and racism. Then we're going to talk about the role of anti-black racism and health, racial health disparities. Talk briefly about some solutions. Uh, I probably should have more on solutions, but maybe we can discuss them. And then I'll very, very brief summary, just one slide. And then we'll have time for questions and comments. Um, OK, uh, I'm not going to read the quotes at the top. I, I presume everybody here can read for themselves. Uh, the first picture, though, some of you may know, that's Dr. David Williams, who was at ISR, is now at Harvard. And when um, my wife and I were being recruited here, I wanted a position at ISR. And my joke about ISR is the only place I've ever been where I had to give a job talk for a job that wasn't going to pay me anything. Uh, but, but, <laughs> But they, they asked me who would I want to meet. And given what we were about to do, the first person I knew several people in the psych department I wanted to meet was, was Dr. Williams. And we were fortunate enough to have several lunches together before he went to Harvard. And uh, other people have said this, but this is from a 60 minute interview with David. Um, so the first thing I want to do is just document in a very brief way what are the health disparities that we're talking about. So relative to white Americans, black Americans are, this is just some highlight. First of all, they have a life expectancy of six years less. Their life expectancy was more affected by the COVID pandemic than was the life expectancy of whites. Um, they have a 40% higher mortality rate for people uh, 35 to 49. Um, uh, there's much higher rate of premature, what's called premature deaths among uh, African Americans than among white or European Americans, okay? Um, they're more likely to, to die from the same disease than white Americans are, OK? Uh, they have, um, uh, Dr. Hagney mentioned this, they have two to three times higher um, uh, in, uh, maternal and infant mortality rate. The interesting thing about this particular statistic is that obviously uh, maternal and infant mortality rates have dropped dramatically in the last 100, 125 years. The ratio has not changed in 125 years. It's exactly what it was 125 years ago, OK? Um, in healthcare, they, on average, receive less aggressive and appropriate treatments for most illnesses, and they have less regular access to medical care, OK? And I could go on and list this more and more. Um, um, I'll tell you one side story about a conversation I had with Mike, where I was complaining about the fact that the publisher was delaying and we couldn't get anything done. And Mike looked at me and said, you think the problem's going to go away? <laughs> and so this is a problem that has a very long history, and unfortunately, I think, will persist into the future. Okay? The important thing to remember about these things, these statistics I gave you, is they reflect disparities, not differences. A disparity is a varying, varying rate of illness or uh, deaths between two groups that are due to political, economic, social, or psychological processes. They are not differences. Differences are relatively immutable uh, biological or genetic characteristics, OK, or due to that. Um, why should I care about health disparities? Well. Um, one reason is, is that very simply, and it, we have a moral obligation. Uh, every human being has the right to the highest attainable standard of, of, of physical and mental health. And as the, uh, President Obama said, in America, health is just not a privilege, but it's a right for every American. Well, but if you're very practical and you say, well, yeah, but that's not my problem. I'm, I'm a healthy white person, um, then be look at the practical thing. The estimate of the annual cost to us of racial disparities in health is for over $450 billion a year, and it's growing. In the book, we say $250 billion a year, but that was written about three years ago. Okay. Also, it adds unnecessary burdens to the healthcare system, which affects you when you interact with the healthcare system. Why are they unnecessary? Because they result 
from illnesses that could have been prevented if we had adequate health care or could have been treated earlier and wouldn't uh, uh, become uh, more, more difficult to treat and, more, and require more resources. Okay, let's talk about race and what it is and what it isn't, because this is important to what follows. Uh, the term race has no biological or genetic meaning. Uh, biologists and geneticists don't even use the term anymore when they're trying to describe uh, the phenomenon. It is, it, the, the, the term race is meaningless for, for one reason. Um, there's, more hetero, there's more genetic heterogeneity within people classified as white and black than there is between them, okay? Race is a social construct. It's how a person self-identifies or is identified for others. It tells you nothing about their genome, um, it but it does tell you a lot about the person's place in society and their life experiences. Now, this doesn't mean um, uh, that heredity and genetics are unimportant. There are heritable diseases. We all know that. Okay. There are also differences in disease incidence for people whose ancestors uh, were from different uh, geographic areas. The example of that is first of all, Tay-Sachs, uh, excuse me, um, sickle cell disease, which is more common among people from West Africa. It, the sickle cell anomaly was, a, would, was uh, evolved because it protected the person against malaria. That does not mean, by the way, that all pe black people are more likely to have sickle cell than white people, nor does it mean that only white people, excuse me, only black people have sickle cell. It's any environment in which there are a lot of mosquitoes. Tay-Sachs disease is, is a, uh, a disorder, uh, uh, illness, which is peculiar to people who, are, who descend from Eastern European Jews, okay? Um, it's what's called the founder's error. Um, so when we say, when we're talking about race, we're not talking about some biological classification. Let's talk about anti-black racism, which is really the issue at hand here. Okay, anti-black racism in its simplest form is the idea that white people and black people are inherently different and the former is, uh, is inferior to the latter. Where does it come from? Well, the, the historical origins are scientific racism. This was a theory that began really with the Greek philosophers and persisted actually in some form up until the 1930s, 1940s in the United States. It's the idea that black people and white people were two different species. That's known as polygenism, okay? That they are two different species, have different characteristics, even to the point where there was a the belief that if they, if they were to mate, the offspring was be, would be, would be uh, sterile, okay? If you look at the list of people who proposed this, uh, you have a list of the leading scientists in Europe from about the 14th to about the 19th century, okay? Um, there, was, there, was, there was this, there was also eugenics. The idea that genes are everything and that some people's genes are better than the others. The United States was, was this original idea that came from England, uh, Sir Francis Galton, but it was widely accepted in the United States and became part of uh, uh, the list, again, of the people who accepted genetic, genetics, eugenics, rather. And what it led to, uh, which we'll talk about, I'll mention uh, uh, later, was um, attempts to limit the ability of black people to reproduce, okay? Um, obviously, we have the long-term subjugation of black people. Below, the pictures, which again, I'm not gonna discuss, these are the parts that, that uh, are pictures that I pulled off the internet which show various aspects of the subjugation of black people in uh, primarily in the American South, uh, but obviously there was the same kind of disparities in the American North. Uh, about two weeks ago, I went with my wife's church, a group of people from my wife's church, and it was called a civil rights pilgrimage. And we went to uh, Alabama, we went to Montgomery, uh, uh, Mon Birmingham, Montgomery, Mobile, and Selma, uh, and saw uh, the history of segregation, not that I wasn't aware of it, uh, but it, it was uh, a, a very moving, very startling trip, okay? 
And one of the things that I had forgotten about uh, was that segregation didn't stop at simply separating the races. There was also accompanying it in almost everything, gratuitous humiliation of people. Uh, and so we'll talk a little bit about what I, some of the things I learned on that trip in a while. So there was long-term subjugation of black people, and then there was competition for scarce resources. Okay, Scom competition for, state, uh, for scarce resources is going to produce intergroup inter conflict, and intergroup conflict is going to contribute, especially when the groups look very different from one another, it's going to contribute to racial bias. The thing that is more concerning is the persistence of anti-black racism in the United States. Um, why does it persist? One of the reasons is cultural stereotypes about black people in entertainment, commercials, general media. Again, these are some representations. The first one is a representation of a, a figure called Aunt Jemima who has reappeared in some commercials. The second one is a scene from Birth of a Nation. How many of you know about the movie Birth of a Nation? Um, it was the first blockbuster movie. It was a portrayal of post-Civil uh, War uh, South during the period of Reconstruction in which the black people in it are, are portrayed as lustful savages, uh, desirous of white women, and they are saved, the, white, the, the purity of white Southern women is saved by the Ku Klux Klan, okay? Um, it was the most popular movie. Uh, that step and fetch it, most people don't know who he is, but he was a, he was a stereotypical slow-witted black man who, who was both slow-witted and devious. These are some um, uh, caricatures that were popular in the literature, okay? So there were uh, cultural stereotypes which persisted and were culturally transmitted. Trans transmitted. Um, also, black people were forced to occupy certain menial, um, uh, 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 certain menial occupations. And one of the things we know from role theory is, is that people infer inherent characteristics from the role someone occupies in society. Okay? So if a person is doing menial, low-skill jobs, that must mean that this person is someone who's only capable of menial, low-skill jobs. Also, there's the fact that humans think in ways that make racist ideas more likely. One of the things that human beings, human beings had a problem as they were evolving. They were slower, they were smaller, and they were weaker than the animals around them. So something had to be done to preserve, to, to make them viable or they would have been eaten, okay? And the things they involved was essentially higher order cognitive functions, okay? So one of the things humans are able to do is to see patterns in the world around them, okay? Uh, that was very useful, okay? For example, agriculture, new one to plant, new one to harvest, okay? But that also tends to lead to the formation of stereotypes. We're predisposed to stereotype other, other human beings. We use prior knowledge to make quick decisions about other people. That leads us to make snap judgments. That is to make a very quick, almost automatic, um, 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 unconscious, not in the Freudian sense, judgment about someone else, okay? And we tend to think of the world as us and them, okay? And we greatly prefer us to them, okay? So all those things would predispose humans to have racial bias and to dislike people who are different from one another. But it has to be strongly emphasized that there is nothing natural or automatic about racism. First of all, it was not part of our evolutionary history. That is, there was no evolutionary basism, basis or advantage for racism. Most you know, early humans didn't travel far enough to meet people who were different from them. Differences in physical appearance that are now associated with different races did not emerge until relatively late in human evolution, about 100,000 years ago. And one of the things about America that is, is interesting compared to other countries is race was much more important as a way to identify a person among English settlers than settlers from other colonial powers, okay? Uh, the English were unique in that respect. Uh, but people learn to dislike or hate other groups. And alas, they learned this very early and very easily. 
this was, um, we were in a, a museum in uh, Montgomery uh, that was created by a man named Brian Stevenson. Uh, some of you may know the name. He was the focus of movie, I think, Just Mercy. It's called the Equal, Just, Equal Justice Initiative. Um, and uh, it's an incredible museum. Uh, but this was one of the cards, um, one of the exhibits uh, from that. I took a picture of it because it was just so incredibly hateful. All right. Um, uh, and so th the bottom line here is, is that racism is a learned response. OK. OK, now let's move to the thesis of the book. Uh, some of you may know who W.E.B. Du Bois was. He was a brilliant sociologist and kind of predated a lot of later sociological work on health disparities. The core thesis of our book is that a root cause of racial disparities in health and health care in the United States is anti-black racism. It affects black Americans' health in three interrelated ways. The first is, is that it causes racial bias and discrimination, which produces physiological processes that endanger the health of a black person. Okay. Secondly, it creates segregated and under-resourced neighborhoods, which contain environments that endanger their health, that is, the health of black Americans. Third, it causes health care inequities, which endanger their health. So we're going to talk about each of these path, uh, paths um, from anti-black racism to health disparities and health care disparities in the United States. Let's talk about the first one. Racism, per se, can make black people sick. The background for this, and it's important as I talk about this to realize that there is nothing unique about black people, or black, uh, excuse me, black Americans. There is nothing unique about black Americans that this process does not describe something unique about them. The process I'm talking about now is true of any human being uh, who is exposed to stress. One of, the adip one of the things that human beings evolved to do is when they're confronted with stress, some stressful stimulus, okay? Their bodies are energized, okay? They've got to engage in either fight or flight. And to do that, they need energy. So the body produces more oxygen, it produces more fats, uh, more sugar, okay? And then that deals with the stressor, uh, and if the responses are effective, the stress is gone. The body returns to a calm state known as homeostasis, okay? But what happens if the humans can't respond to chronic stress? If the stress can't be removed, the body is chronically energized. It remains in this state of arousal, if you will. Okay? And if that is true, that's called allostatic over overload. Actually, it's called allostatic load, but I call it allostatic overload. The physical wear and tear, the results from the inability to achieve, um, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, allostatic overload is the physiological wear and tear that results from the inability to achieve homeostasis. Okay, and that's a little, uh, I don't know where I found that on the internet, but that's a kind of a graphic demonstration that if you, uh, if you adapt, you're fine, the teeter-totter is fine, not you got an elephant on your back. Okay? What is the physiological burden then of racism? Well, chronic stress uh, and allostatic load, uh, experiencing discrimination is a stressor for all people. That is, I can cite for you studies where the, where the participants are all white and we find a significant relationship between the amount of stress, uh, discrimination a person reports experience in their life and um, uh, physiological arousal, allostatic overload. So there's nothing peculiar about the, the uh, black Americans in this regard. But Black Americans report racial discrimination as a daily experience that cannot be avoided or easily removed. Thus, they are often uh, chronically, physiologically activated and experience the allostatic load. Now, one of the people who's done the most research on this is uh, another faculty member at the University of Michigan, Dr. Geronimus. Um, this is from one of her early studies that um, uh, measured allostatic load in black populations and in white populations. Where you measure allostatic loads, there's a number of biomarkers you can use. Cortisol level, 
um, um, certain uh, substances in the bloodstream, things like that, okay? And what Dr. Geronimus and her colleagues did was to track this in the national sample of black people and white people across the lifespan of 20, from 20 to 60 years. And what you see um, is that at almost every age, starting from about age 20 to at least age 60, black Americans have a higher allostatic load than white Americans do. Again, that's because they experience discrimination as a chronic stressor, and they're unable to release uh, relieve that discrimination and that, and therefore that stress. Okay, what does it do? Uh, well, again, we have a quote from Dr. Geronimus, um, uh, and the the effects that we talk about in the book is it's associated with metabolic uh, and multiple illnesses and metabolic systems uh, in the immune system and in the brain. It also results in a shortened lifespan, okay? It's what Dr. Geronimus called weathering. And when she first proposed weathering, people kind of discounted it. All right, the, she uses the term weathering. If you think about an old house where the wind has been blowing and the rain and the snow, okay? And the roof gets weathered and things like that. That was the construct she came up with. Uh, it was originally, she received evidently a fair amount of criticism of that, but in fact, she's right, okay? Every indication I have is the weathering analogy is an excellent analogy. Um, examples of that are premature deaths, dying before the age of 75, and there's actually a faster biological aging when you're exposed to discrimination. Uh, um, that is, there are ep what's called epigenetic effects, okay? Um, one of the ep ep epigenetic effects of um, chronic discrimination, experience of chronic discrimination, is shortening of the, shortening of the telomeres which essentially protect the individual genes, okay? So you can demonstrate an association between experience of discrimination and shortening of telomeres, which is really biological aging, okay? Now let's talk about residential segregation. And again, there's a lot more that I could talk about, but I'm trying to keep this within a reasonable time limit. Americans live surrounded by people who look with them, look like them. In Detroit, for example, if we had full inter residential integration, about 70% of the population would have to move, okay? Um, what's the primary reason? Well, one of the reasons, of course, is we like to be with people who look like us. That's okay, we have personal preference, there's nothing wrong with that. But that's not the primary reason. The primary reason was that for most of the 20th century, the government, private developers, developers, banks, the real estate industry created racially segregated neighborhoods. Uh, has anybody read the book Color of Law? Oh, good, great. It's a great book, okay? The author's name is Rothstein, and he, he's a historian from Berkeley, I think, and he does an outstanding job of documenting how the, the U.S. government actively worked in the segregation of, uh, to create segregated neighborhoods. Um, the areas where black people were assigned were usually places where other people didn't want to live, okay, and were under-resourced and socially isolated. The two pictures at the bottom here um, illustrate what the government did. There was a housing shortage starting in about the 30s, and the government started building, either subsidizing housing or building housing for people, okay? Those are called housing projects. There's one on the right as you look at it, that's the that project, I'm blocking the name, but it's in Detroit, um, which the government built. But what the government said when they built this was they have to be in neighborhoods that are racially harmonious to the occupants of these buildings. So they built these in black areas, okay? At about the same time, the government was doing something else. Actually, it's a little bit earlier. Uh, I don't know if you can see from this what this is. This is a nice suburban development, okay? After the war, there was a housing shortage and soldiers came back from the war. The government actively subsidized the building, the purchase of homes in these places. Levittown is one for some of you, um, I suspect a few sociologists who know about Levittown. Levittown was a series of these uh, cutter, uh, uh, cookie cutter homes there were built uh, areas with cookie cutter homes that were built for returning veterans if they were white. 
They didn't do that for black veterans. Indeed, one of the things that the government told the Levitt family was no black people here. Okay? So what the government was doing was basically underwriting segregated housing. Okay? There's a, a graph, which I didn't include in this, that shows the rise in segregated housing in the United States from about 1890 to about 1950. It's a very dramatic uh, increase. Okay? Also, what the government did, I'm sure many of you are aware of this, is they engaged in something called redlining. Redlining means exactly what it said. If a bank wanted to lend money to someone, the government was guaranteeing those loans. But the government said, we're not going to guarantee bad loans. So we'll tell you what areas you can make loans in. Okay? And the bad ones are red. They were colored in red. That's a map from Baltimore, 1936. Okay? And the reason for that is one quote, this neighborhood has little or, no, little or no value today due to the colored element now controlling it. Also, they felt the same way if there are large numbers of Asian, people of Asian ancestry in the neighborhoods. They redlined those areas as well. Now, so what is the effect of that? The effect of it was is there was little or no public or private investment. If you owned a home, you couldn't get a loan because you lived in a red zone. One of the interesting things about this particular map is if you look at health data in Baltimore, this was 1935. If you look at it in 2023, 2024, you will find that the lifespan of people who live in those red areas, almost 100 years later, is significantly shorter than the neighborhoods that surround them. Okay, And the health problems are much greater. But let me show you something that is, I think, even more illustrative of the effect of, of neighborhoods. Whoops, I'm sorry. Um, uh, I, I forgot about slide. So here are the health dangers that result from living in a segregated, under-resourced, um, uh, isolated area. Now, let me stop and make clear. Not all areas that are segregated with the predominantly black population are uh, areas where there are significant health problems. Okay. Again, we're not talking about some process that is unique to people of color. Okay. Uh, anyone who lives in these neighborhoods has the same kind of health dangers. First, there's a high concentration of poverty. Okay? Uh, poor people live in these neighborhoods. More specifically, poor black people live in these neighborhoods. Okay? There's poor air quality and other environmental toxins. Okay? I, there was a study that just came out. I didn't have it in my slides. It showed in, in these in traditionally segregated, isolated neighborhoods, there's less biodiversity. And that's because the air quality is so much poor. Okay? Um, there's restricted unhealthy choices. This is what's known as a food desert and a food swamp. A food desert is exactly what the name implies. You can't get uh, food. You have to travel out of the desert. A food swamp is a little more, his name isn't quite as obvious, but it's, there's a, a surplus of places. What kind of places are they? Fast food. Thank you. Okay. Uh, high calorie, tastes good, uh, basically crap. Okay. Um, uh, what are the health problems? There's greater mortality, there's more preterm and low weight births, there's a higher incidence of infection, infectious disease, heart disease, cardiovascular diseases, cancer, there's weakened immune systems, and there are even epigenetic effects. Okay. Just to be clear, an epigenetic effect is when it doesn't change genes, it changes how genes are expressed, how they're activated, okay? And one of the things that we've learned in the last 25 years is that genes are not immutable, that genes are, are affected by our environment. The old question on nature and nurture, um, I used to tell my class, uh, I'd say that the question uh, that I said to him for 30 years I've been teaching and no one ever asked me a stupid question, now you can ask me a stupid question, is it nature or nurture? Because the answer to that question is yes. All right. <laughs> One of my students as a graduate student said to me, does that mean we're going to have to take the physiological psych class? I said, no, that wasn't exactly the point I was trying to make. OK. So what we know is, is that there are all these um, uh, health uh, dangers of living in that community. Well, this is a map of the uh, subway system uh, not the subway system, but the transit, the major transit city in the si uh, system in Chicago. Okay, 
this is the, the, this train is called the L because even, even though most people think of a subway system, most of the tracks are elevated, okay? And what this shows, um, well, I'll use the pointer, okay? This area, well, you can't see that, can you? Okay, so let me walk over here and everybody, I think everybody can see me over here. So the distance from this L stop to this stop is about a mile and a half, okay? This is almost exclusively, and the residents in this area are almost exclusively poor uh, black Americans. This is a wealthy area, almost exclusively wealthy white people, okay? It's about a mile and a half. The difference in life expectancy is 16 years, okay? Everything else is in Chicago, 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 okay? I live, by the way, a little bit south of that. You can't see it, uh, okay? And you notice that if you go uh, to this area, okay, uh, if you go uh, to East Garfield Park, which is another um, segregated neighborhood, mostly populated by uh, low-income black people, the difference is what, about 14 years? No, 13 years, okay? So this is not some hypothetical things. Well, we think that's what the effect of living in these areas does. Okay, I'm going to digress. Um, I know I'm running out of time, but I only got a few more slides. Uh, there's a great study. We begin the book with this study called Dying Before Their Time. Does anybody know that study? It was done by three physicians at uh, Wayne State. And the, the really interesting thing is, you know, Detroit has lost an incredible amount of population in the last 40 years. And most of it is due to white flight, loss of jobs, things like that. But what these physicians showed is a significant contributor to the decline in population is the premature death of black males because they weren't replaced by anybody. And the, the study is called Dying Before Their Time, okay? Um, just to make that clear, the rate of, the mortality rate among black men from about 60 to about 75 is about two or three times what it was for people in other parts of the state and the population hasn't been replaced. Okay, and finally we get to uh, disparities in healthcare, okay? What's the background history for this? Uh, racism is an integral part of American medicine. Black people were abused in medical education and research. We know about the Tuskegee syphilis study. I assume everybody knows about that, okay? Uh, a scientifically uh, worthless study predicated, by the way, on polygenism, okay? The idea was is that the progression of syphilis in people of African ancestry would be different than the progression of, of syphilis. Uh, there's my timer, but I'm gonna go about five minutes over. I, I told you that was gonna happen. Um, uh, anyhow, um, there was also something which is less well known, is uh, the medical schools in the 19th century, actually up until about the early 20th century, needed cadavers. And what they did was they went into black cemeteries and they raided uh, these and pulled black um, uh, bodies out to use as, as cadavers. I'm going to do a brief digression, okay? Has anybody ever seen this picture before? Anybody? If you go to the med school, you'll see this picture here, okay? It's from a series which was commissioned by Park Davis, which was 45 paintings depicting great moments in medicine. That series, when Park Davis went, became Pfizer, and then Pfizer left Ann Arbor, they gave it to the med school here, okay? Does anybody know what that picture depicts? It's the experiments of, of J. Marion Sims, the father of, of gynecology, okay? And, it, and he developed instruments which are still used in gynecological examinations, the speculum, okay? He worked in about the 18, in mid 19th century, okay? What the picture depicts is a black woman dressed in a certain kind of a sterile surgical gown with two assistants, okay? Uh, and this is considered a great moment in medical history. The women, the two other women are in the background. This was actually done in a backyard. The women were between 17 and 19 years old and they were enslaved. The woman in the picture, her name is Anarka, she had surgery performed on her at least 15 times without the benefit of anesthetic, um, uh, even though there was, ether was available, okay? She was not in a surgical gown, she was naked, 
She was in her backyard, and he invited people from the community to look at her genitalia. Okay. Um, I, I, I discovered this, uh, uh, well, I discovered the next thing when we were in Montgomery, and we were given a tour by a woman named Michelle Browder, who's a, uh, uh, an artist and has a, uh, uh, you can find it online, it's called Mothers of Gynecology. It's a tribute to the women and what she has in her studio, which is in, uh, on the property that Sims did the experiments. She, it's in Montgomery, it was an old building, there was a nice part to the story. The property was on sale for $70,000. She said she went to the owner who she described as Mike Pence with glasses and thought, they're going to do what they always do. They're going to raise the price because a black woman's asking for it. He said, come back tomorrow. She came back the next day, and uh, his wife came down, and she said, well, how about $35,000? And she said, what? She said, consider it reparations. So Ms. Ms. Um, uh, Browder now owns this, and she has this picture, which is a little bit of a twist on that. And I thought I would share that with you. Um, so to return, um, there was, the, there was also the medical community participated in limited procreation uh, among black Marins, uh, Americans with forced sterilizations. This takes us back to eugenics, okay? Eugenics were so common, the forced sterilization was so common. In Mississippi, they were referred to as the Mississippi appendectomy. Uh, some of you uh, might know who Fannie Lou Hamer was. I know, I know <laughs> at least one person does. A, a real heroine of the civil rights movement. She went in um, um, for um, a routine gynecological examination, and they sterilized her. Okay, uh, this was done, by the way, uh, very clearly to limit the political power of Black Americans. Okay, the forced sterilizations became more common, for example, in North Carolina when the civil rights movement began to uh, enable people to vote. Um, and finally, before 1964 and 1965, which to me is, is still a recent event, it's less than 100 years ago, healthcare in the United States was segregated, or there was none at all, okay? Um, that is, it was legal to not treat black people or to treat them in separate facilities. And the pictures I have here, the last picture, shows the kind of wards that black people were assigned to in a lot of southern hospitals. They were usually in the basement, they're often in the place where the cleaning tools were, okay? The reason why I mention this is the legacy. While malevolent racism in American healthcare is gone, okay, there is still overall poor quality of care for black patients. And one of the bits of legacy of this is the substantial mistrust of black patients of med medical care they're going to receive, okay? We're almost done, okay? Also, one of the things that's true is there are these persistent myths in medicine about basic biologi uh, 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 biological, physiological differences between black people and white people. These are still accepted by a significant segment of medical professionals. Black people naturally have he healthier kidneys. I'm going to talk about it a little bit more. They have less lung capacity. Uh, they have thicker skin. They feel less pain. If you look at those things, stop and think, why would those myths, what would be, what kind of justification would those myths provide? Yes, sir. Well, yeah, or no anesthesia, but there's a more basic one, it's an economic one. It was the way you treated enslaved people, okay? I can whip them or I can make them work harder because this is natural for them. Um, what the result of this, which is contemporary, is race corrections in diagnostic formulas for disease, okay? Black patients are less likely to get a correct diagnosis and treatment, okay, in some diseases. Kidney disease, it's almost gone now. Um, but still, in certain environments, the, 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 this myth still affects diagnosis. Um, I can't see it from here, but if you look over there, that's a test of kidney function uh, that was done by Michigan Medicine on um, an unnamed patient, okay? And this was 2021, so about two years ago. And it gives um, uh, what's called uh, EGRF, which is basically how well your kidney's working. The major determinant is how much creatinine you have in, uh, in your blood, okay? 
uh, creatinine is like a waste product produced by the, by the kidney, okay? This is the same patient. What do you notice about um, their EGFR value? If the person was black, they have a value of 56, okay? Which in absolute sense is pretty good. It's only three points down. If they're white, they have a value of 49. Why is that? Because the belief was that because black men are more muscular, why would they believe that, okay? Because black men are more muscular, they create naturally create more creatinine. So we have to adjust for that, okay? And in the formula, there's literally a race correction. Now that's gone from Michigan Medicine. And many of you are getting a kidney function, Michigan Medicine, you will not see that anymore. It still exists, by the way, in the federal prison system. They still use those numbers in the federal prison system, which means in many instances, documented instances, black patients are not getting adequate care for kidney disease because the higher creatinine level uh, uh, is not seen as, as, a, as a pathological sign, okay? You figured out who the patient is? Uh, okay, so let's get to, get to racial disparities in health today. This final, final couple of slides. Um, there is de facto segregation of health facilities in the United States. Black patients are more likely to use emergency rooms than any other racial ethnic group. Black patients are more likely to retreat in safety net hospital. Safety net hospital is one where anybody who comes there has to be treated. They're less well-funded. They have fewer staff. They have lower quality. They have poor patient safe, safety. Now you say, well, okay, well, those are the neighborhoods that are in the black neighborhood. The, the hospitals are in the black neighborhoods. But the fact is, is that patients are steered, black patients are steered to lower quality hospitals, okay? There are, you may, if you, anybody from New York, you may know these two hospitals. Bellevue is one, Lagone Center is another one. They are literally side by side. They are on the same street, okay? Bellevue is a safety net hospital. Lagone is an elite hospital, okay? That's where the privileged send their family, okay? This is the proportion of black patients that are treated at Lagone. This is the proportion of black patients that are treated at Bellevue. Black patients, even though they're side by side, they, black patients are significantly more likely to be treated at the safety net hospital. Well, do they live closer? No, what we find is even when the safety net hospital is farther away, black patients are more likely uh, to be treated there. So in summary, I think this is the last slide. Oh, so um, these are the health disparities. Um, the percentage of black physicians um, hasn't changed. They're terribly underrepresented. That's less than 5% hasn't changed in eight years. Uh, in oncology, 2% of all medical oncologists are, are, are self-identify as black. 3% um, of medical school faculty. Um, black physicians earn 65 to $85,000 a year less than do white physicians. Maybe we talk about why that is. That's not a simple finding. Uh, black patients get less appropriate and aggressive treatments. Um, I'm gonna, you can read for yourself, I'm gonna skip ahead to the last slide, which is physician implicit bias, which is the work we've been doing. Um, let's talk first, of, implicit bias is a term that is used so much today and 90% of the time it's used incorrectly. Let me tell you what's not. It's not having racial stereotypes uh, in, um, uh, about black people, okay? Uh, it's not derogating black people in medical records, which is done, okay? It's not believing the black patient's self-reports uh, uh, being less likely to believe black patients self-reports of symptoms. Um, that's not implicit racial bias. Implicit racial bias is automatic or non-conscious thoughts or feelings about black people. They're, they're the product of an overlearned response to black people, result of how we are socialized as we grow up. Most white people have implicit racial bias, including me, okay? There's no, but they are not, nor am I, a racist bigot, okay? Uh, it, as I say when I've given this lecture to doctors, uh, uh, grand rounds, I say, look, there's no villain in this piece. But physician racial bias does harm black patients. Physicians have moderate to high levels of racial bias. And this is reflecting the work we did at Carmanos. Black patients who interact with high implicit bias physicians remember less about the interactions, they're less satisfied with the interactions, they trust the physician less, and they have less confidence in recommended treatments, okay? Now remember, these patients don't know that these doctors are high in implicit bias, okay? 
These are from two kinds of interactions. One were 15-minute interactions at primary care center. The second one was in uh, with oncology patients. High implicit racial bias physicians dominate conversations. Their behaviors are less supportive. They display more negative feelings. They have less confidence um, in patients sticking to recommendations. They spend less time with patients. The effects of this on the outcome of the, inter uh, of the interaction are as great as the effect of chemo, post-surgical chemo for breast cancer. It's a very large effect, OK? Um, I, hopefully, I, you can ask me some questions about that, because there's some interesting things. Um, Solutions, I'm just going to go over very quickly. One is to reduce stress. One specific place where that should be done is with regard to law enforcement. The primary fear of most black in America is, is that they're going to be somehow hurt or killed by law enforcement. Okay, And they have some reason to believe that. If you look at the graph here, they're about, um, uh, about twice as likely to be a victim of, of violence. Uh, we need to improve the neighborhoods, but the way we do that is not these grants to private developers that money never gets back to the individual people. We need to do targeted uh, resident, uh, investments to target uh, residents. We need to provide healthier foods and more hospitals. The, 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 there's a dearth of hospitals and segregated on resource neighborhood. We need to make healthcare more equitable. Um, uh, we need to increase the diversity of healthcare professions, okay, and require institutional accountability for either care. None of these are going to be easy to implement. But good health is a fundamental right of all Americans, and we have a moral and ethical obligation uh, to eliminate health disparities. This is a summary, but I'm going to stop now and take questions. You might have, we have about, I'm sorry, we only have about seven minutes left. I told you I'd go over, but um, I apologize. I'll be glad to stay longer if, if you have time. So questions or comments? Yes. Hey, Beverly, how are you? Good to see you again. Yeah. What's really the situation of the U of M? What really is the situation of the U of M um, with respect to being um, one of those two types of hospitals? Um, oh, it's clearly it's clearly it's an elite hospital. It's an elite hospital, but what do they do if somebody shows up and doesn't have health insurance? Like, do they literally turn them away? Or uh, no, I don't believe they do. I don't know. I don't know enough about that. Uh, private hospitals. What what private hospitals do? We've discovered this when we first got to Detroit. Is they do something called dumping. Uh, they they know that the patient is going to be covered. One of the problems is is that if patients Medicaid patient the hospital earns significantly less than that. So what they were doing in Detroit, because uh, Carmanos was, was um, essentially a safety net cancer center, is they were dumping patients. Places like Beaumont, which is no longer Beaumont, I, I mean, they were saying, no, we can't treat you. You need to be treated at Carmanos. I don't know that the University of Michigan does that. I, I suspect they do not. But I don't know. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't draw that conclusion. It's clearly an elite hospital. What I do know is that they have a much, much smaller Medicaid percentage of, of patients of color and Medicaid patients. Okay, uh, There was one physician from there who wanted to do postdoctoral work on racial disparities in health. He was at the University of Michigan, and, and he started that. And one of, the, one of his colleagues said to him, hey, how does it feel to do work on racial disparities in health when there are no black people in the sample? Okay, so he came over and worked with us at Comanos. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Steve? Oh, okay. Yes, um, yes, sir. <clears throat> My question is two parts. No, one, uh, when we talk about the term, like mention the term people of color, what does that mean? I mean, white or non-white? White and black? Okay, or... yeah, you raise a very good point, and which is second... I've only talked about okay. black people. Perfect. And second part is that... Uh, talking about the calibration of medical instruments that adjust for racial differences, like you mentioned, in terms of giving the case for a kidney as well. Is it still happening? Like today's the medical instrument automatically have this implicit or uh, software bias in them, which accounts for different racial differences? Or not? Oh, yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, the volume of research on racial bias, implicit bias against other racial or ethnic groups, what you're asking, is much, much more limited, OK? Um, what we do know, for example, well, let me say, my, my surmise is, 
is that if we were talking about any racial ethnic minority group, you're going to find implicit bias towards them. And we know that Hispanics, um, people of Hispanic or Latinx ancestry, uh, the disparities are nowhere as large, but the disparities in healthcare are similar. Okay, we know in Canada that doctors har harbor the same kind of implicit bias between First Nation or Indigenous people. So if you ask, um, our presumption is is that almost any person of color will experience um, uh, poor health care on average. Again, the disparities aren't as large, and if they are a significant minority in a sample in a country where people could be socialized into being exposed to a lot, there'll be implicit bias. Am I answering your question? Uh, yeah, basically white or non-white. You know, it's it's skin color. Other questions? Yeah, yes. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, let me take the gentleman behind you, and I'll get to you. Yes, sir. Let me walk over there. Yeah. I so, think that I need hearing aids, but I fake it. So I had a question on whether age has a has a relation to anti-black racism. Is there kind of greater or less? anti-black racism in physician practices on, let's just say like pediatric patients, one compared to adult population? Well, we don't know about, I don't know of any studies yet that have looked at implicit bias in pediatric, with pediatric cancer samples, it's a very good question. What I do know is the type of treatment disparities that exist for adults are matched perfectly by them, by treatment disparities for pediatric patients. For example, black pediatric patients diagnosed with a respiratory disease mm -hmm. are significantly less likely to get the standard of care that white patients get. So what would be my surmise? Oh, another thing, black, young black children are significantly less likely to get the same pain medication and the same dosage as white uh, children, okay? The explanation of for older uh, black people is, oh, well, they're all, they're all drug addicts and we don't wanna feed their health, but these are six and seven year old kids. Right. Okay, so my assumption would be if we if someone did the study, we'd find that. Okay. You had a question? Yeah, do you have any yes. Um, I just wondered what your recommendations were in terms of training the next generation of physicians, given right, given evidence about implicit yeah, bias and 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 framing, and so how do we how do we intervene in terms of the training arc? Yeah, that's a very that's a very good question, and that's a critical question. Everybody, everybody heard that, right? Um, and um, one of my co-authors said that my problem when I give talks is I scare the hell out of everybody. I don't provide any solutions. Uh, and he said, that's what social psychologists do. do. So, um, uh, well, it's, it's a difficult question to answer. We, we, we had some things that worked that we tried. At, at, let me just give you quickly. One thing is that institutions themselves need to monitor what they're doing. For example, if, I, if, you're, um, if you're University of Michigan Medical um, Hospital, are black patients and, black and, and white patients with the same disease getting the same treatment? Turns out they typically don't, okay? Um, uh, what's, the, what are the, um, uh, what's the recidivism rate? That is how many patients are readmitted after that? Things like that, which are quality of care. The reason why I think that's more important than just talking about it in a lecture is that becomes internal, and that becomes a me measure of, of quality improvement, okay? You can't, you can't say, oh yeah, that's okay, but we're, and I'm not picking on the U of M, but we're the University of Michigan, you know, uh, uh, you know this is where people go for medical care. How, um, that's, that's one thing. Uh, a second thing is, is that our work and other people's work suggests that implicit bias training may have some side benefits, but it doesn't work. If it's an automatic overlearned response, how are you going to change that in a three-day workshop? What does work is giving physicians instruction in, in how to communicate differently with a patient. Let me give you one example. In social psychology, we know that something called individuation, that's a, 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 a jargon term for treating a person as an individual. So you are not a young woman you are a young woman who has her own unique history, okay? 
uh, you have a family, you're, if you're sort of one place or another. Okay, and now if we take this as a black, this is not a black woman. This is Mrs. Jones, who has three children. Her husband works at four, da, 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 da. The effect of individuation is to reduce the tendency to stereotype. You don't have to tell a physician that he or she is a racist to do that. You just need to give them certain techniques and communication, okay? Finally, we did a study with primary care patients uh, in Northwest Detroit, where what we did was try to reduce, when we talk about us and them, what we tried to do was reduce the feeling of us and them. So we did all these kind of hokey things to make them feel more like they were a team. We had buttons with the same color on them. We gave them pens, things like that. We didn't get changes in the physicians and the patients, okay, which they trusted the physician more and they complied more with the physician recommendation. So what I'm saying, and much too short an answer to a really important question, is, is that there are individual interventions you can do. Um, a lecture like this isn't gonna change anything, okay? It might depress you, but it isn't gonna change anything, okay? Also, one other thing that's very important, that is true, is how physicians are trained. The training, there was a study by 11 physicians who uh, pu they published this in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is the most highly cited journal in the world. And what they did is they did a content analysis of the curricula at the 11 med uh, medical schools they went to. And um, paraphrasing their conclusion is, the conclusion, uh, they said that, look, race is a social construct, but you wouldn't know it from the curriculum, okay? And so physicians are being trained Go back to those myths. Those myths persist, okay? So we need to change the training. We also need to make diversity uh, a more important thing. But look, one of the big problems right now with the physician force is the Supreme Court's decision on affirmative action. And there is one solution to that, which doesn't involve the University of Michigan. We need to dramatically increase our support for HBCUs because they do an infinitely better job than Michigan or any of the, any of the, you know, the really prestige universities in training black physicians. 50% of all black physicians in the United States graduate from HBCU. And if you know HBCUs, their, pop, their student enrollment is a fraction of what it would be, okay? Uh, they go to medical school, they graduate, and that's because they educate them. They view shortcomings in the students as a challenge to be overcome, not as a reason to cream, cream the crop and, and uh, screen them out, okay? Yeah, I was just going to bring up that in Michigan, at least, all health professionals need to do implicit bias Thank training, you. at least for license renewal. I'm sorry, start that again. Well, I was saying in, at, in the state of Michigan, you have to do implicit bias training uh, for license renewal. I'm not sure how effective that is. But. Well, uh, you know, I'm... I'm by nature cynical. Uh, I grew up in South Side of Chicago. I think there are better things they could be doing. I'm, I'm saying they shouldn't do it, but there are better things they can be doing. That isn't going to turn a high implicit bias physician into a low one. Anything else? Yes. Speaking out the, the terms of implicit bias or disparities, when there's interaction effects, such as uh, male or female or yeah, very, religious denomination or not. Right, right. Uh, you're talking about inter intersectional, yeah. Right. Um, there's not a lot of research on, on that. I can tell you as a main effect, uh, well, there is some. As a main effect, um, people who identify as a sexual minority uh, uh, receive poor health care than people who identify as a, as, a, as a sexual majority. There is some evidence that uh, black women who are lesbians, that's one of the few intersectional studies I know about, receive poor care, okay? I study race, but that does not mean that things like gender, okay, or sexual identity are not important, and we know that they result in health disparities. I can't give you a better answer than that. Okay, yes, sir. Question, uh, in your slides, you, you show how there was redlining with um, yeah. particular areas and whatnot. Yeah. Is that, the case in medicine as well, like redlining in regards to not giving people of color specific form of medicine or treatment oh. because of? Well, what we know is, is that 
there are significantly fewer hospitals than are of lower quality in red line districts, districts that are red line. Okay, uh, a large reason for that is economic. Okay, you can't make money on Medicaid patients or people who are federally subsidized. Am I speaking to your question? Okay, so we know one of the reasons why the health is poor in under-resourced, uh, predominantly black segregated now, is there's fewer doctors, okay? Doctors don't wanna work in those places because economically it doesn't make sense. If you're doing primary care in a safety net hospital, you're gonna make significantly less than a person who's doing primary care in Ann Arbor and a lot less than someone who is doing rheumatology in Ann Arbor. And just to expand on that, so you are less likely to find black people in these specialties. I used to tease a colleague of mine who's an oncologist at Henry Ford that he was 50% of black oncologists in the state of Michigan, okay? One of the reasons why black, black physicians are less likely to be in these specialties, part of the reason is financial, because it requires more education. And, and uh, the other reason is, is it turns out that um, certain recommendations in medical school are an important criterion for whether you get that fellowship Black students with exactly the same academic record and number of publications are significantly less likely to be admitted to those medical professional societies. Okay. Uh, but the, the important the important is black physicians want to work in in underserved, low income, and they want to do primary care. Uh, yeah. One I, I can stay, but but you you don't have to. Uh, Thank you.